Okay, well, thank you everyone for showing up in person and, and thank you for the people who are, are showed up for the, the, the streaming uh, presentation. So yeah, so today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, corporate oyster gardens in late 19th century North Carolina. Uh, the term gar oyster garden might sound a little odd, might sound like small scale operations. The term's a little bit deceiving. It's actually much larger um, operations that I'll be talking about. Um, it's more like oyster farm, what we would know today maybe is oyster farming, but in the 19th century, the term oyster farming hadn't really come about. And so people were, at that time were calling it oyster gardening. And uh, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm gonna be talking primarily about oyster gardening or oyster farming in uh, the Pamlico Sound. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, oyster gardening going on elsewhere within the state, but we just don't have time to talk about all that. But um, before I go any further, I would like to um, thank and uh, mention that the live stream um, was made possible by a donation from H2O Captain to our friends of the museum. Um, so thank you very much. All right, so we'll just jump into it. So. Um, right after the Civil War was over, there's this nationwide oyster boom that's going on um, in the United States. And um, a lot of that is because there's been an expansion of transportation. So more railroads, more canals for steamboats to move cargo quickly up and down the coastline. There's steam canning, so you can actually uh, can oysters and, and eat you know, those safely. And you can transport those all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, and there's also this prosperous post-war economy following the Civil War, where you have a rising middle class, people have more money to spend on nicer, more palatable foods like seafood, particularly oysters. And during this time period, basically from the end of the Civil War, all the way up to right before World War I, um, the oyster was the most valuable seafood um, in the United States. Um, it was four times the value of salmon, which was the second most valuable seafood in the United States, just to give you some perspective on how valuable it was. And so here's a, a nice quote to sort of kick us off. Um, and sort of when, from 1876 by J.B. West, when uh, oyster farming, which is sort of, sort of in its nascent stages in North Carolina, just starting out, says this industry with us is just in its infancy. The few thousand bushels planted by my friend George Ives of Beaufort will soon swell into millions and every acre of oyster ground be worth not less than $1,000. Talk of your Nevada and Arizona gold mines. Why, sir, we have a big bonanza on our, at our very doors a mine that will return if properly worked untold gold. So there's a lot of money um, that people believe that they can make off of oyster farming. And a lot, they believe this because large scale oyster farming was going on in Northern states like Connecticut at massive scales and it was incredibly profitable. Um, some of those oyster farms were actually exporting their oysters to England. Uh, that's how successful they were in Connecticut. And so just to give you a quick um, overview on, on the sort of the legal situation with oyster farming leading up uh, to this point, you have in 1822, it was illegal to export port oysters from North Carolina. Um, somewhere in the 1840s, you have this sort of uh, local um, small scale oyster farming starts up in North Carolina. In 1855, it became lawful for white North Carolina residents to cultivate oysters and export um, cultivated oysters, um, enslaved people and, and free um, African-Americans were not, were, ex were not allowed to engage in this activity. Then in 1872, uh, North Carolina established an oyster season and permitted the export of oysters. Um, and then in 1883, oyster cultivation laws expanded to all North Carolina residents, both black and white. Um, and additional protections were provided to those cultivating oysters. So, for instance, laws against poaching. Um, then the big thing that happens is in 1885, 
the North Carolina legislature passes a resolution called a resolution in regard to the oyster industry of the state. And basically uh, the General Assembly of North Carolina said, oysters are really valuable. We're not taking advantage of them in our state. Other states around us have been, and they've been prospering financially from it. North Carolina needs to get into the game, but the legislature um, recognized the depletion of the oyster industry in the Chesapeake Bay due to over harvesting of the naturally occurring oyster beds. And they said, we don't wanna be like the Chesapeake Bay um, that has this overfishing problem. We want to cultivate oysters. We wanna have big oyster farms and we wanna have this renewable oyster resource for the state that will last many, many generations. And we want oysters to be the big industry for Eastern North Carolina, you know, textiles, we're sort of the big industry for the interior of the state, um, the Piedmont, um, Eastern North Carolina didn't really ha have a whole lot going on. Um, so in 1886, 1887, uh, you have this North Carolina oyster survey that takes place where you have Lieutenant Francis Winslow of the US Navy is brought in to map out the oyster beds of the North Carolina sounds. He had done this in like Tangier Sound and the Chesapeake Bay um, to and was quite successful with that project. Um, unfortunately, he was not able to complete the survey because the Navy recalled him for other duties. They're gonna send him out to sea. Um, and so, but the conclusions though from his studies and his surveys were like North Carolina has a lot of potential for oyster farming. And then in 1887, uh, oyster laws, more oyster laws are passed. Um, you have the establishment of the Board of Commissioners of Shellfish. This is the first shellfish commission and their job was basically to use Winslow's study and pick out the areas that they're gonna allow people to go oyster farming and pick out the areas that were just gonna be for um, harvesting naturally growing oysters. And you had three commissioners and this all fell under the North Carolina Board of Agriculture which is now the Department of Agriculture. Um, and so, um, so they established a licensing and a grant system for oyster cultivation. So you would have to go to state, get a license to have an oyster farm, but you, got a, you had a grant for the bottom um, to cultivate. So um, today in North Carolina, you have a leasing system for, for cultivating oysters on the bottom. But back then in the late 19th century, you got a grant and you owned that bottom of the sound. And they call it, the language that they used was a perpetual franchise for the cultivation of oysters. Um, and there's other things that took place with these oyster laws, like setting the bushel as the unit of measure for oysters in North Carolina. Um, so 1889, they published the oyster survey and the first shellfish commission is disbanded because sort of mission accomplished. We're promoting the oyster industry in North Carolina. We have this, the Pamlico Sound at least um, has been mapped out in terms of the oyster beds and we're getting um, the oyster farms sort of off the ground. Then um, in 1889, uh, Winslow had a career change. Um, he retired from the US Navy and he came back to North Carolina and was hired as general manager of the Pamlico Oyster Company, which was one of these corporate entities that popped up um, in about 1888 um, to start farming oysters in North Carolina on a grand scale. Um, and they called the Pamlico, they referred to the Pamlico Oyster Company, at least the press did as the Oyster Syndicate. Um, you have the Wilmington Messenger in 1889 writing, the oyster syndicate represented by Lieutenant Winslow and which is now engaged in preparing their oyster gardens near Ocracoke Inlet is composed of capitalists from New York and Asheville. Some of the persons are Messrs. Uh, Barrett and Higgins of Wall Street, New York and Messrs. Martin Churchill and Dr. Battle of Asheville and vicinity and others. They have purchased 2000 acres of oyster grounds in Hyde and Carter counties. So when I talk about oyster farming on a grand scale, it's it's really big, it's really massive. And the, um, the, the newspapers aren't exaggerating either because the, the deeds are there for these oyster farms. Um, it, so I went through North Carolina State Archives going through all these applications. And this is what one of the applications looks like for you know, setting up an, an oyster farm. 
Um, and 20, I found that 20 for Hyde County in 1888, 25% of all the applications came from Asheville, North Carolina, the mountains of North Carolina, and 7% came from New York, New Jersey. So yes, these, these capitalists from New York and New Jersey and, and Asheville are indeed purchasing vast amounts of land or un submerged land in Pamlico Sound. You had James S. Churchill, who is the trustee of the company. Um, December of 1888, he purchased four acres on Ocracoke Island for $1,000 to set up the base of operations for the company. Um, so warehouses, offices, that sort of thing, uh, wharfs. Um, 1889 secured um, six, over 1,600 um, acres, nearly 1,700 acres of bottom off Ocracoke and Portsmouth Islands. Um, and they were able to buy up the more just by going after other people who held um, uh, grants to bottom in the sound. And so we actually have maps and I hope you can see them pretty well here. So this area that's gridded off with the blue numbering, those are, that, that's part of their oyster farm. Um, and then this area, we have these sort of weird looking little red circles with these sort of black boxes. Um, those are the naturally occurring oyster grounds, the oyster reefs um, that are behind Ocracoke. And this is Portsmouth right here. The rest of their farm is over here. And then more naturally occurring oyster grounds. And so um, in January of 1890, um, there's a lot of drama that was produced by this um, farm. The, the locals from Ocracoke felt really threatened by this big company coming in out of nowhere and taking up all this area um, close to their islands, butting up right against their, their oyster reefs um, that they had historically for generations and generations harvested the oysters from. And um, so they started, the, the locals from Ocracoke started threatening the employees of the Pamlico Oyster Company with weapons. There's plenty of accounts of employees being with uh, guns being pointed at their heads, things like that, uh, destruction of homes, property. Um, you had an employee um, fled Ocracoke and went to mainland Carter County because he was afraid of being murdered. Um, the mail boat was threatened with being burned. Um, and the reason was because the mail boat, apart from bringing mail to the island, was also bringing employees from the mainland um, to, to Ocracoke. Um, and the, the locals from Ocracoke um, actually wrote, the, put their threats into writing um, and delivered them uh, to, to Winslow. And we actually, had those, those um, all, all these letters and correspondence actually still exist within the archives today. Um, then at the January 30th, 1890, you have this armed standoff between Winslow and his employees aboard a schooner while they're working their oyster farm and anywhere from 35 to 40 um, armed uh, Ocracoke oystermen. And Winslow and his crew were armed as well. And so there's this armed standoff, you know, sort of staring contest, see who's gonna blink first, who's gonna fire first. After 20 minutes, nothing happens and everyone goes their own way. No one was hurt. Um, however, um, people were really concerned about the situation developing um, on Ocracoke Island. Um, the following day, the Ocracokers petitioned Governor Fowl um, and they wrote to him and they, they complained that Francis Winslow had imported black oystermen to Ocracoke that was one of their central complaints um, that the Ocracokers did not want to work for Winslow at five cents per tub. And they, they were complaining about this because they're saying, well, he's offering us less than the going rate um, right now. And the reason he was offering, so the going rate at the time was eight cents per tub. He was offering five cents because he was wanting uncold oysters that he could that were coming off the naturally occurring um, oyster rock and being transplanted on these farms. Because basically you can take a bunch of um, oyster shells, 
put the, these oyster shells, scatter them all over your, your oyster farm or oyster garden, and then put live oysters on there when, so when they reproduce, more, um, you know, the, the embryos will go out and attach to the shells and make more oysters. And so within a few years, you'll have um, marketable oysters. So all the oysters that he was trying to get the ochre pokers to uh, catch for him, were not going to be going to market. They're just gonna be transplanted onto his farm. Um, and they also wrote to the governor saying, we're gonna start taking matters into our own hands to prevent Winslow from uh, oystering, meaning things might get violent. Um, so Ochercoke was an open revolt. Um, the sheriff of Hyde County was unable to enforce the law on the island. Um, there was all these reports coming that the Ochercokers were allegedly um, gathering arms and ammunition on the island. And um, there's actually conversations going on between um, the sheriff of Hyde County's office and the governor's office of invoking uh, posse comitatus. So basically the sheriff would go and get um, local men from mainland Hyde County, arm them, ferry them over to Ocracoke and have them seize control of the island under arms. Um, that was way too politically controversial at the time. And so the governor said, don't do that, please. Um, we don't need to divide um, Hyde County between the mainland and the island. And so uh, Governor Fowl, um, you know, in his wisdom, uh, sent um, his, his personal emissary, Sef Warren, to go and talk some sense into the locals um, on Ochre Cokers. And he convinced them, uh, Warren convinced them to turn themselves over to the sheriff of Hyde County. And so uh, you have a court was held um, in, on, the, on the mainland in Middleton um, to, to try this situation and uh, by jury. And uh, so both sides made their case, jury deliberated and they came out with a verdict of not guilty. Um, so all the ochre cokers were set free um, and everyone sort of went their own way. So what was really going on with this situation? Um, it, it's pretty complicated. So you have this, so the Pamlico Oyster Company, as I mentioned earlier, they are removing uncold oysters from the naturally occurring oyster grounds and transplanting them on their own beds. The practice was legal in North Carolina and it was an industry standard at the time all along the Eastern seaboard. Um, as I mentioned, they're trying to employ the locals, um, but the locals didn't seem to really understand what was going on. Um, they didn't quite seem to grasp that these oysters weren't going to be going to market quite yet. And that's why they're being offered less money. And um, that's what I think was, was really kind of central um, to, to this dispute, was a misunderstanding perhaps. Um, then there's also, you have these differing ideas of property rights. Uh, the ochre cokers saw the oyster beds as being communal property. So essentially the locals only saw those beds should be exploited by the people from the island, that people from the outside did not need to be coming in and taking their, their oysters. So there's a territorial element to this. Um, the Pamlico Oyster Company um, viewed the oyster beds as common property uh, because that's what the state had designated these beds uh, these naturally occurring beds by law, um, that anyone, any resident in the state of North Carolina could come in and take the oysters and use them for whatever purpose, to transplant them onto an oyster garden um, or to sell them on the market, as long as it was done legally. Um, so um, there's also, also what I think was going on was uh, in a problem of proximity, um, so if, if you really kind of, it's confusing because th these farms are legal, but they're really, really close to the naturally occurring beds. And here, let me just pull up this map and so you can get really a bigger view. I mean, this farm really does butt right up against these naturally occurring oyster beds. And so you could see where there might be confusion, you know? Um, you know, if, if you're looking out from Ocracoke Island 
and you're like, well, I know the oyster beds are there, but there's a farm that's right there too. And, you know, is the, is the farm encroaching on the naturally occurring oyster beds? You know, I can see that there being a lot of confusion for both sides, perhaps, um, even though that uh, the farms were staked off. Um, so there's also accusations of dredging, illegal dredging that was going on. Uh, so the ochre cokers had accused Winslow of also, and this was really just sort of like a minor point that they made, was that um, he was dredging in water that was less than eight feet deep. They used um, uh, dredging in six and a half foot deep water. Um, the question is, was he dredging on these naturally occurring beds or was he dredging on his own um, uh, his own farm, because one of the things that they, they did back then was you could run a dredge to kind of help spread out your, your colch um, or your, your oyster shell that you're scattering. And so we don't really know what was going on. Uh, no criminal charges were brought against the Pamlico Oyster Company. So we kind of have to assume um, that, they were pro that they might have been um, dredging on their own property, which was legal. Oh, that's another thing too. Um, dredging on your own oyster farm was completely legal, just no matter the depth at the time. Um, another issue that was going on was there was an active territorial dispute um, between the people of Ocracoke, Portsmouth Island, and Hunting Quarters. Hunting Quarters today is basically uh, the Atlantic North Carolina area um, in the court in Core Sound. Um, all three of these groups were competing for access to the same naturally occurring oyster beds. And then you have a big company comes in um, and inserts themselves in the mix. So um, you can see where there's all this intense competition, misunderstanding, um, people feeling like they're being pushed out of an industry that's in their own backyard. Um, and I don't think the, the uh, um, Pamco Oyster Company really understood uh, the situation at the time. So the problems didn't end with Ochre Coke. Um, you had another company called the Far Creek Oyster Company that started off with about 600 plus acres um, of oyster gardens. And it started up in 1891, um, is based out of Englehard, North Carolina, which is mainland Hyde County. Um, and is founded by Metro Makeley, who was this very wealthy, influential North Carolinian at the time. He was um, a, a member of the North Carolina um, House of Representatives. Um, he was on the Fish Interest Committee um, within uh, the General Assembly. He was um, also had sponsored a lot of the, the key oyster legislation that was behind establishing oyster farming within the state. He was also this sort of lumber and farming uh, magnate. He had founded a town in Hyde County called Makeleyville. Um, and he, he, was, he, he started off actually, his 600 plus acre farm started off with a hundred acre grant from the state. And then he went to everyone else and started purchasing up their grants to sort of augment um, his own property. And so this is sort of generally where his farms were located in Hyde County. Um, and so there's this nice little um, interesting uh, clipping uh, from the newspaper, which mentions him putting barbed wire around his, um, the areas that he had staked off for an oyster farm, which is so kind of bizarre to think about putting up, um, you know, barbed wire in Pamlico Sound, kind of like barbed wire for like a real farm. But um, so, so Makeley, became really resentful because he had been pulled into a political situation in North Carolina. Um, it says, the news comes from the sound that M. Makeley killed a man. His name uh, we could not get. He was dredging on Makeley's oyster beds and after being forbidden to stop, which he refused to do, was fired upon in our 
if our oyster laws will not protect the people, let the legislature do something, stop the introduction of so many bills, but do something. And so this was a rumor that had popped up in Eastern North Carolina that Makeley had murdered someone who was poaching his oysters. And it was completely false. He, Makeley wasn't even in the state. He was out of town on a business trip to Alexandria, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, DC, in Terrell County, North Carolina. Um, he was headed, he, he went to Raleigh um, because the, the session of the legislature was about to start. And everyone's like, hey, we heard you killed someone. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And all of his employees from the oyster farm, they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. It was a huge false rumor, but that rumor and several others were a pretext for military action um, by the state in Pamlico Sound. Um, you had the Pasquotank rifles were sent out um, to suppress the oyster pirates. You know, these, these oyster dredgers are coming out down from the Chesapeake Bay, the steel North Carolina oysters. Um, and the North Carolina governor had gone and gotten a uh, howitzer to put on a steamer from the, the Virginia, uh, the governor of Virginia to actually go against the Virginia oystermen. And um, this armed steamboat cruised around the North Carolina sounds and nothing ever happened. Uh, There's no violence, nobody had any guns. No one was, you know, stealing, well, there might've been some stealing from oyster farms, but it, it wasn't what it had been made out to be at all. Um, the rumors were also a pretext, and the military action was also a pretext to ramrod legislation through uh, the North Carolina legislature to ban oyster dredging in the state. This was prompted by um, Senator Lucas of Hyde County. He was anti-dredging, he was anti-oyster canneries, he was anti-corporations, particularly anti-oyster farming corporations. Um, and that was sort of his thing at the time. And everyone went with these really sort of draconian laws that really kind of not only suppressed these oyster pirating in North Carolina, but also suppressed North Carolina's own oyster industry. Um, and so then that same year, 1891, uh, you have the rise of the second Shellfish Commission, which rather than really sort of promoting um, oyster farms and, and, and oyster industry, it was out to regulate um, the industry and protect um, oyster farms and, uh, well, more really the naturally occurring oyster beds. Lucas, who had just left the North Carolina Senate, was made the first chief shellfish commissioner. He's basically the guy who wrote the law, um, or was very instrumental in writing and getting the passage of the law, was made the first shellfish commissioner. Um, he, um, and his job was to monitor the harvest and sale of oysters, enforce the dredging and calling laws, and, uh, to get patrol boats for the North Carolina sounds. And so later in 1891, you have the chief oyster surveyor. So this guy was, his name was W.G. Lewis. He was supposed to go out. And when you had sort of an application to set up an oyster farm, you had to have an oyster surveyor come out to look at the area and make sure there's no uh, naturally occurring oyster rock or reefs. Um, on that area that you were laying claim to that was basically barren of oysters and that you're going to go plant oysters there and start something from scratch. Um, and so W.G. Lewis was out in Pamlico County uh, when he was threat, he and his crew um, were threatened by local oystermen. Um, so he was given verbal threats when he went um, on the mainland and um, while his guys are waiting in dock on the vessel, oystermen start shooting up the boat at night. And of course, um, this, is, this is probably in relation to the Brant Island Oyster Company, which you have, so this is Pamlico Sound and you got mainland, you know, Pamlico County over here and you have Brant Island out here and then coming off of it, you have Brant Island Shoal. Um, but anyways, a lot of, naturally occurring oysters were out in this area and you had this company that came in and set up a big farm. Um, it was owned by W.T. Cahoe and Dr. Gates of Pamlico Counties. Cahoe had actually been one of the commissioners on the first shellfish commission and they had 
um, whether inadvertently or not, established an oyster farm that had a lot of naturally occurring oysters and the locals were not happy at all about it. But at the same time, the, the farm didn't get revoked by the state. Um, and so the locals feared monopoly of the naturally occurring oyster beds by these private companies. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the oyster, so the oyster survey that had been done by Winslow had failed to locate all of the naturally occurring oyster beds in Pamlico Sound. And as I mentioned, Brant Island Oyster Company got a hold of some of these naturally occurring oyster bottom. Um, Francis Winslow, um, at the time with the Pamlico Oyster Company, inserts himself into the situation saying, hey, I didn't know about the, these oyster reefs. Sorry, I didn't document them. My bad. He's trying to save face, um, essentially, um, with the situation. Um, but the company had really angered the locals because they had sent out all these sort of pamphlets about their company. Um, and they said that the Pamlico County oystermen were allowed to take oysters off of a third of the company's grounds if they agreed to plant oyster shells on the company's grounds in the off season. And if they obtained a permit, so basically a license from the company, not a license from the state, they made that very clear. You don't need to get an oyster license from the state of North Carolina. You need to get an oyster license from us, say our oysters. And not only that, but you have to pay a tax to us of a penny per bushel. Um, and we're only gonna allow tongs and you also have to observe the coal wall. Um, there's also allegations that WH Lucas, the chief shellfish commissioner at the time had cited this violence against um, uh, his chief um, oyster surveyor um, inadvertently with incendiary speeches against um, corporations. So um, in 1891, he would been traveling up and down the coast of North Carolina, making speeches about, you know, these um, terrible oyster pirates and these terrible oyster corporations are coming in and stealing, you know, naturally occurring oyster reefs and things like that. And he was getting a lot of the local oystermen fired up. And he had, he had been in Pamlico County and, and had upset a lot of people. And people are starting to think, well, maybe, you know, these speeches were not such a good thing. Maybe they're inciting violence. So the governor at the time, Governor Thomas Holt, um, ordered a stop to the, um, to the issuing of oyster farms in North Carolina. And he says, we, we need to go search for these naturally occurring oyster beds um, and basically finish Winslow's work. Um, and this was to stem more violence and avoid confusion and litigation and, and all sorts of political issues. And so um, Lewis went back out into Pamlico Sound to continue the oyster survey, to continue documenting these naturally occurring, um, these oyster bottoms as well as farms. And, but he was under the protection of 10 bodyguards when he went out. Um, and so during this time, you have this alliance that's forming amongst these big oyster gardening or oyster farming companies. Um, you have, uh, Winslow with the Pamlico Oyster Company and Makeley with the Far Creek Oyster Company kind of combined forces um, and express a lot of grievances um, to the state in the uh, winter um, sort of spring time frame of 1892. Um, and they make all these allegations against the Shellfish Commission uh, that, the, that, um, when the, that the commission was encouraging poaching on Winslow and Makeley's oyster grounds, their, their oyster farms, and that Lucas um, had tried to prevent dredging on private oyster grounds, and that Lucas had vowed to arrest Winslow. Now, the last two points that Lucas had tried uh, to prevent oyster um, dredging on private grounds, that absolutely happened. Tons of documentation on that. And that also that Lucas had vowed to sort of arrest Winslow, that's also, pretty much true, he, he kind of wrote a letter where he expressed that, that view. Um, the thing that's fuzzy is that first point, whether or not the Shellfish Commission was encouraging um, poaching, 
it's a little fuzzy. We're not 100% sure. But the dredging question winds up going before um, the North Carolina Attorney General. And uh, he advised that the law did allow dredging on private grounds and that the Shellfish Commission, that they needed to cool it um, because they're exceeding their legal authority at the time. Um, and he's told Maclin Winslow, go ahead and continue doing what you're doing. Um, so then there's a question though of state sanctioned poaching. Um, and, and this is where things get pretty tense um, because there's allegations that Adam Warner, who was the assistant um, shellfish commissioner, and he was also the guy who was in charge of the state's patrol boat that went around enforcing the shellfish laws, that he had been going around telling the oystermen to take oysters from uh, these corporate um, oyster farms. And um, so Makeley and Winslow, they're calling for Warner's resignation, as well as an investigation into the Shellfish Commission. And so what becomes, what gets interesting is Ocracoke becomes divided over the issue. Um, in 1891, uh, oyster laws that had been championed by Winslow ruined the North Carolina oyster industry. And the people of Ocracoke who depended on that industry were now out of work. And their only recourse was to go work for these corporate oyster farms like the Pamlico Oyster Company. And um, so, um, sorry, Winslow, um, Lucas, sorry, not Winslow, but Lucas was interfering uh, with the planners uh, like Winslow. Um, and some of these um, ochre cokers, uh, they, but still some of them, they, they weren't really in favor of a people uh, like Winslow and Makeley, uh, they, they were sort of fell in the camp of, of Lucas and the Shellfish Commission. So you've, you've got a clear division. Um, Keho, um with the Brant Island Oyster Company, he kind of took a different tack. Um, he, and he's actually friends with um, these, other, these other guys. He's friends with uh, with Winslow and, and the people at the Pamlico Oyster Company, he starts publishing pamphlets um, that attack the Shellfish Commission. They attack Lucas and his leadership and basically saying North Carolina oyster industry is not going in a very productive direction. We need to get rid of Lucas. We need better leadership and we need to, to have basically a more liberal industry that allows easier oyster farming, uh, easier dredging, unnaturally occurring oyster rock, et cetera. And so what you wind up having are these hearings that investigate the Shellfish Commission. And the hearings are held at New Bern, Vandermeer, and Washington, North Carolina, um, to investigate these allegations, particularly of state-sanctioned poaching um, on oyster farms. And what's it, it's really interesting because they have these hearings at New Bern, Vandermeer. And then right after they have the hearing at Washington, the stenographer who's recording everything that's being said at these hearings, he becomes very ill and dies. And they bring in all these other stenographers to try and make sense of the shorthand and translate it. And nobody can figure out what his shorthand means, what it says. And the governor at the time, he's unwilling to to uh, fire a state servant until he has all the facts in front of him. And because he's not able, no one's able to read the stenographer notes and they don't wanna repeat these hearings. They just said, forget it. We'll just kick the can and let another administration deal with this problem. Um, and so you did have a new administration and a new solution. And so you had Governor Elias Carr comes along on the heels of this sort of disaster with the stenographer dying and the hearings coming to nothing. And he's inheriting all these political issues. And so, um, but Lucas's term as a chief shellfish commissioner was coming to an end. And he's, the governor was under a lot of political pressure not to reappoint uh, Lucas. Um, there's even people within the Shellfish Commission are writing to the governor saying, don't reappoint this guy. This guy has been a disaster for us. Um, however, Lucas wanted to be reappointed 
um, and that he thought he was being unfairly characterized by the press and by the oyster farmers. And he offered to take a pay cut. He, he had been paid $1,200 a year and he was willing to take $40 a year just to maintain his office and his position within the state government. Um, but you know, um, you had all these people who were advocating for new a new shellfish commissioner. Uh, some people were advocating for Cahoe to become one. Um, particularly, the oyster farmers wanted him uh, to to be the next shellfish commissioner. But that was going to be sort of a conflict of interest because he had this major, um, uh, you know, oyster farm, and he's deep in the business. He, he's probably not going to be the best pick. Um, the the Democrat Party, particularly from Hyde County, really wanted Israel Watson to become the next shellfish commissioner. And he had actually been on the first shellfish commission. Um, but I, I, I'm guessing that the oyster tongers, the small time oystermen were very strong constituency in amongst the Eastern North Carolina Democrats. And so they probably didn't wanna to have too much political control over this office. And so the governor wound up picking out someone that no one was really calling for. And that was J.S. Mann, was appointed chief shellfish commissioner. And he was appointed in September of 1893. Um, lawyer, had been a former representative from Hyde County. And Adam Warner got reappointed as assistant shellfish commissioner. But Adam Warner died the following year. So by 1894, there's nobody controversial left within the shellfish commission sort of a new slate. Um, but unfortunately, you wind up having a collapse of the oyster gardens, these oyster farms. Um, one of the problems you had was uh, very political. Um, so you had this case that went to the, the state Supreme Court, state versus Spencer. So in 1893, Shellfish Commission had confiscated an oyster farm that was owned by this Spencer um, fellow in Hyde County, and they're claiming that it had contained natural occurring oyster rock. The case went to the Hyde County Superior Court in fall 1893. February 1894 wound up in the state Supreme Court. The decision was that no claim of fraud or mistake, there was no claim of fraud or mistake in the, in the original complaint that had gone to the Superior Court, and that the state could not revoke a grant except after compensation and under the principle of eminent domain. So essentially the state was placed in a position where they had to either give this guy his oyster farm back or had they had to provide him with monetary compensation for it, which set a precedent um, for the future. And you had a big political problem that erupted right after this, this case. Um, you had what was called the Pamlico County Oyster Cases, which is a little bit of a misnomer because it also involved Carteret County. So in 1893, the Shellfish Commission had ordered the investigation of basically 700 oyster gardens in Carter and Pamlico counties, which sounds like a lot, but um, uh, it's basically, the law at the time said that an individual could only own up to 10 acres of bottom. So basically what we're looking at, you know, 7,000 acres is what the state's investigating of sound bottom. By the time they're getting this, this thing into the courts, um, state versus Spencer had already passed and the, the case was basically irrelevant. The state couldn't take these farms away. Um, and if they did, they would have to pay these people. Um, and so, but the investigation into these farms did uncover rampant fraud with oyster farming in North Carolina. Um, what had been going on, they discovered, was that people, so because you could only have 10 acres per individual, what people were doing was, what was legal at the time to do was, okay, 10 acres for myself, 10 acres for my wife. 10 acres for my son, 10 acres for my daughter. So 40 acres, right? Well, then people were, what was illegal though, was people were also saying 10 acres for my dead father, 10 acres for my dead grand, or to my dead mother, 10 acres for my dead grandmother, et cetera. They're putting all these dead, there's all these dead people 
that had, people had been dead for like 10, 20 years that had oyster farms in North Carolina. Not only that, but there's people who had oyster farms that didn't even know they had oyster farms. So people were saying, I'm gonna claim oyster bottom for my neighbors and not tell them about it. I'm just gonna write their name and forge their signatures. And so that's how some, some people were amassing, you know, really large acreage um, for oyster farms. Um, and so there's a lot of elections that were going around um, in the 1890s. Um, state elections, and this became an issue, a tug of war between the North Carolina Republicans and the North Carolina Democrats. And because this had taken place under the watch of North Carolina Democrats, the Republicans were coming after the Democrats and saying, oh, look, you know, the, the Democrats are basically asleep at the wheel. Um, but what's worse, they're basically accusing um, Pamlico County government officials of who were Democrats of corruption. Um, and this, this issue was in the courts for many, many years. So it was primarily litigated from, you know, the 1890s going into the early 20th century. Um, and it just tied up tons and tons of state time and money, um, getting the whole mess sorted out. There's also um, hurricanes that destroyed these oyster gardens and oyster reefs in North Carolina. There was a really devastating hurricane that came through in 1899 and covered up all of these with sand, including the Pamlico oyster companies. There's lots of documentation saying that that farm was basically covered up in sand. Um, you also had gardens that were being abandoned due to environmental change. Um, you had silting. Um, so. Uh, you know, all the silt basically coming down from the rivers and, and covering up and choking out the oysters. You had changes in salinity um, due to like fresh sets, fresh, all, high amounts of fresh water coming down and, and changing the salinity um, in the sounds, uh, which the slowed oyster growth, but in some instances even killed oysters. You had parasites that were running rampant through the oyster population. And you had mussel infestations in some areas that were killing off oysters as well. And so by 1899, uh, the experiment had basically come to an end with giant oyster farms being this large speculative industry within the state due to uh, all these political and environmental issues that were going on. And um, that's basically all that I have for you. Um, if you all have any questions, um, you know, please let me know and I'd like to entertain them. The state grants you some sea bottom, yeah. water bottom. How can I sell that? I mean, I so you, so that. you would, so, so basically how, how you would sell that is, and this went on a lot, and I wasn't able to include this in, in my, um, uh, uh, my talk, but so basically if you got granted 10 acres of bottom, you could though go and then seed that bottom and turn around and sell it. And it was something like 25 cents per acre starting out in terms of purchasing from the state. And there's plenty of instances, because if you follow, you can follow the sale of the, these plots through um, uh, the register of deeds books for various counties and people would seed bottom and then immediately try and flip it um, and sell it at like 50 bucks. And then someone else would buy it, hold on to it for a little while and flip it for like 125 bucks. And then, you know, farther down the line, people are flipping them for like $100 an acre. Um, and there's speculation gets really rampant. Where you really see a lot of this stuff happening um, was particularly in the New River area, which I didn't go into, but there's very large oyster corporations down there and massive, massive sort of underwater for real estate speculation um, with these things. But basically it, it, there's, it's quite easy to sell um, your acreage. It's just like selling a piece of land. Yeah, but I don't understand if, if, if the state is granting you this property, mm -hmm. why aren't they just taking it back if the person doesn't, doesn't need it? Why wouldn't I just, especially since the Manhattan industry was in such huge form then, why wouldn't I just lease it to a corporation, a farm, 
well, well, there's, well, there's, there's leases as well um, for, uh, um, they, people were also leasing oyster bottoms to like their neighbors and things like that as well. But really you kind of see more like people flipping, um, you know, selling, like I was mentioning earlier. Um, and, and where there might be some confusion is why, how these corporate entities wound up with really large plots. And so with the articles of incorporation for some of these, these corporate groups, the state was allowing them to have large plots up front. Um, and then what they would do is, and it's very easy to track, um, they would get their shareholders to buy 10 acres because 25 cents an acre, you know, isn't, it, it's expensive then, but for people with money, it, it wasn't that bad. But then basically that these, these, these stockholders would then have their 10 acre holdings and sell it back to the corporation at cost. And so that's how some of these companies wound up with huge, huge plots. Did your research uh, merge at all with the Sherman Indian Trust Act that uh, with um, Carnegie getting its railroad that incorporates maritime law at all? No, I, I, I didn't quite look at that some. I did look at, there's a lot of um, uh, legal, uh, there's a lot of legal papers that have been and sort of economics papers that have been written on oyster farming. Um, and I started getting into it, but yeah, it's uh, some of the stuff, um, some of the antitrust stuff that I saw was happening like right at sort of the turn of the century. Um, and I know in, in 1917, North Carolina changed this whole system. Um, they moved away from the grant system to the lease system because of all these issues that they're having. And there's tons of other issues that people were had with these oyster grants and these oyster farms, um, apart from uh, some of these these business interactions. But yeah, there's a there's a lot to unpackage with this stuff. So in your blurb, it talks about a tulip style uh, uh, bubble. Oh, uh, you know what? Frenzy. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Yeah, so I yeah sorry I had to pare down the presentation for the sake of time. But yeah, so as I was mentioning earlier, if I had time to go more into um, sort of like speculation within the industry and like the, particularly the New River area, um, where I was mentioning earlier where people were buying up properties from the state fairly cheap and then flipping it as soon as they had seeded it. And that, that's kind of what I was referring to. And in New River, you do get a bubble um, and it, it bursts towards the end of the 1890s. Um, and um, that industry basically sort of collapses in on itself. The New River area is really interesting because not only were there large corporate farms there, um, and th that's where some of the earliest oyster farming in North Carolina was, um, but a railroad was run from Wilmington to Jacksonville, North Carolina, um, in part to take advantage of the oyster industry. And they had that railroad up and running by like 1890. And that's when those corporate oyster farms in that area start taking off. And basically, and those corporate oyster farms were being run primarily by um, capitalists out of Wilmington, North Carolina. And they're the ones who are driving um, um, creation of railroads um, in that sector. Um, not, but it's for oysters, but also for agricultural products and, and lumber. But, but if you read a lot of the literature on it, um, or a lot of primary sources out there, there's a lot of serious conversations that are being had about um, oysters. Uh, because the New River oyster at the time was considered to be one of the most valuable um, one of the most delicious oysters to come out of North Carolina. Um, and the reason that was, the reason why the New River oyster was valued so highly was because it was in the 1880s, late 1880s, um, there was uh, an industrial exposition in Boston that state of North Carolina participated in, and they took samples of oysters up to it. And all the oyster dealers up in Boston went crazy for uh, the New River oysters. And so that kind of gave it this 
uh, sort of popularity. Yes. Sorry, the the where, where the the second and third. Oh gosh, I can't remember. Um, so first was oyster, second was salmon. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I know probably sort of like I don't know. I don't want to say that I know the American shad industry was was very big in North Carolina um, at the time. Um, probably some of the New England fisheries. I'd have to imagine. Um, but um, what uh, do we have any other questions? David, could you bring yeah. So, which bit? Do, so you want to look at secondary sources, or I think I have a lot of things mixed in here. So, no, I'll probably a book one day. No, no, no. My master's thesis was on like British naval history. Um, so it, there's th these are sort of the, the manuscript collections. So yeah, there's uh, things coming in, a lot from state archives and um, East Carolina University. Um, you know, uh, a lot of newspapers. I think I forgot. I forgot to put in here. Um, I I used a lot of the um, uh, register of deeds records from like Hyde County and um, Cart County. And when I was gonna do the New River area, Onslow County, um, and those are fascinating because it's more than just deeds that are in the Red Register of Deeds office. You also have, um, you'll have bankruptcy papers, uh, leases, contracts, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of information that you can get on corporate entities uh, or just private holdings of individuals. Um, from from those offices. Um, that, so there's a question from online that I see. So I thought oysters, what, whether um, formed uh, Maine or Gulf of Mexico were all the same species. So why make the distinction between natural and seeded? So I, the, the, the distinction, so uh, they're actually different species that occur along the coast. Um, I think it's North Carolina, it's some Virginia, I don't want to mispronounce it. Do, do you know it? It's Virginica something or something. It's something Virginica, but anyways, uh, I forget the, yeah, but um, anyways, so your naturally occurring beds are, those are basically the, the oysters that are out in the wild. Um, that, you know, you go out in the sound and you see an oyster reef and, and it's probably, you know, been there for a long time and nature has created that. And then you have your seeded ones. Those are your artificial man-made ones where people have taken oyster shells, put them there, and then taken live oysters, put them there and let them kind of take off. Um, man put them there. And then someone, uh, there's also a question. Uh, that I mentioned a few times that the oyster garden collapsed. What does that mean? So that's alluding both to uh, sort of the system itself, the, the business, the uh, financial system of oyster gardening collapsed. Um, people quit the business in North Carolina. Um, people quit making farms. They abandoned their farms. Um, Why is because uh, like I mentioned at the end, you had eco you had um, uh, environmental change, natural occurring, uh, you know, it was storms coming through and tearing up the oyster beds, covering up with sand, choking them. Like I said, muscle infestation, um, uh, temp uh, water salinity changing. Uh, oysters are very sensitive uh, to, to salinity in the density of water. Um, so they can only grow in certain areas. Um, and so that's basically what it was. And it's very expensive to create large oyster gardens. Um, but yeah, so basically the, the by, by the early 1900s, people were pretty much through with it. Um, and uh, 
yeah, and by like 1917, the state rewrote the laws for how to handle it. Yes. So in the perfect language on the grant, I mentioned they were in perpetuity. Yeah. Are there people who still like own any of that bottom? I don't know. I think that's a question for the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, I know this. Okay. Yeah. So so apparently there are a few grants that are still active. Um, the thing with the grants, in order to keep them legally active, what you have to do is they have to, those gardens or farms have to be maintained. They can't be abandoned. And I think there's a time limit. So if they've been abandoned, I can't remember what the laws said, it's a certain number of years. If, if they go untended for a certain number of years, and like if the, the posts, the stakes have fallen off and no one's put up new stakes, things like that, to mark off their grounds, um, the state will reclaim them. Um, and they were offering to resell them when the grant when the grant system was still going. But basically, as long as you were using it, those grants, you had them in perpetuity and you could sell them and treat them like private property, like private land, as long as you use them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just we just did that one. Yep. Well, biologically, they're the same. You know, they're, they're the same. They'll they'll grow the same. You're just basically, it's just you know, you the oysters are are sessile creatures, so they don't get up and they move around once. You know, once you know their embryo fixes to a point, they're there permanently until they die. Um, and basically, you'll have these, like I said, naturally occurring, where nature creates these own reefs where they might attach to other oysters or rocks or what have some sort of hard substrate, and just populate that area on their own. Um, and then people can do things, they can dump shell out into the sound as, with live oysters and get them going that way. You can take, um, one of the things that people were doing, they took tiles and they dumped them tiles out into the sound um, and put live oysters out there and their embryos would um, grab hold of this, those hard tiles and populate, populate those. There's even bits where I was reading where people were taking you know, pieces of wood and um, getting sinking wood and doing it. There's all kinds of, things that people have tried in the past. Um, and there's various methods that people use today. Uh, today, people have these sort of three-dimensional um, hard structures that they'll sink out in the water and uh, they'll have sort of these sort of vertical columns of oysters growing on them. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's different ways to do this. And then did you... Did you see the yeah, yeah, we did that one. <laughs> Is there anything from Facebook? No. Nope. Okay. Any other questions? Anything about like the people or some of the po political situations that I talked about? Yes. I just got here yesterday. What's the, what's the status of the fishery now? Is it pretty good? The Appalachian Coast, Appalachian Coast, uh, uh, they, and so, the thriving oyster fishery is utterly collapsed. It's yeah. Um, so the, the North Carolina oyster industry, you know, up to like the 1890s, there's a lot of oysters in North Carolina up until the 1890s, and um, they're over harvested in the state um, and pretty much devastated by the early 1900s. The state spent the rest of the 20th century trying to bring the oysters back with mixed results. Um, as of now, I don't know, because one of the 
problems we have now with the oyster industry is yet pol pollution is a huge factor. So there's a lot of oyster grounds that are shut down for harvest because um, just the water's not clean uh, due to runoff um, from like urban areas and sewage. And um, oysters being filter feeders, they'll retain all sorts of nasty bacteria that they filter out of the water. So I, I'm not sure how much um, you know harvestable naturally occurring oysters are out today. And I think that the, the oyster farming, I think is coming back pretty strong, but I think they've run into some issues recently. I don't know, the, you're, oh, you got well, that oyster. Yeah, certainly the population of the storm and the water quality and the Oyster farming in the last five to ten years has really come back and see the uh, levels of harvest from naturally occurring. Yeah. So, for anyone who's still watching the stream, um, basically, we we're just discussing with someone who's getting into oyster farming um, that you know, basically um, the most sustainable, renewable, best way of getting oysters in North Carolina is seems to be through farming. Um, and in my expert, the things that I really study anyways with um, oysters is basically the 19th and early 20th centuries um, in terms of, of oysters and shellfish. Um, anything, any other questions? If not, I think we'll, kind of call it quits then. Oh, thank you. Oops. How do I, how do I quit? Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Um, do you have the picture of